So I'm going live. I'm going live. So you all can. And what we're going to do is I can see if Christine can. Res, re, re, Christine, if you can hear us and see us now, if you could please request the mic, then I can authorize the mic for you. And maybe that will fix be a workaround. Yeah. Uh, manage the mic. All right. I'm assuming. Let's see. Uh, let me ask, can you see us? Now, if yes, please request. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, she just wrote me that she doesn't have this icon. You are speaking now. So she is not registered yes. as a speaker. I'm not sure. Yeah, she just confirmed to me too because I sent her a screenshot. So I think that's probably the issue. But yeah, uh, but I can give her the mic to speak if she requests it. But now she's gone completely, so I don't know. See, she left the room. Mm -hmm. So maybe she'll come back in as a the speaker because we're gonna get started in a. So we start in one minute, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, whenever you're in Berlin, lovely co-panelists, please <laughs> feel very welcome. It's uh, Love super interesting what uh, what you you do all over the world. I'm very very excited. No, I, I, can only strongly, to, uh, I can only strongly recommend the gallery, Eva Ross. <laughs> Beautiful yeah. pictures, beautiful oh. location. Everything's beautiful. Okay. And she always has a white wine in her fridge. <laughs> <laughs> wine. <laughs> okay. I hear Berlin is going for a major surgery. Right. <laughs> All right, let's see. It's still not speaker. Let's see. Chat. Um, so she's got a, okay. Ah, invite on stage. Uh -huh. Okay. Where is that? I just went to something. I just clicked it. What was that on? Uh, this like tiny bubble going up. I was just, that was getting like ready. Oh, say so it's saying getting ready for the stage. So let's see. There we go. Approved. And I just tried to approve her, and we both approved her. Christine, can you t speak now, at least, since we've approved you for the mic? Maybe you're on mute. We've all approved you. Um. <laughs> Oh, yay! She was there. <laughs> I saw her. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, I just saw her on the camera. It was okay. just a minute, like two seconds. Okay. I saw the square come in, but I didn't see anything mm -hmm. in the square. I saw she had a red uh, blouse, I think. So that was. Manage like. Okay. Well, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and. <sighs> Yes. Well, it doesn't look like anybody else has joined us, though. I'm. Let's I'm see. actually not sure if we only see the people who are also speakers. That's that's the question. It says attendees. Is there anyone in the room listening to us already? Or that yeah, I think what I figured there? out also for the other panels, it was only the attendees being the people. I think in. Okay, so what we will do is welcome in case. <laughs> You are here with us, and um, we cannot um, 
see you. We are short one guest and we'll hopefully be able to, to have Christine join us very quickly and want to thank everyone. So we're going to talk about extending gender diversity today. So would like for my panelists to introduce themselves, um, briefly give anything you'd like for us to know, and then your first job, just so our audience gets to know you a little better. Um, so we'll start with Maribel. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to Oasis for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this global panel. Congratulations for this magnum event. Thank you also to Christina, Christine, Eva, Betty, and Markov. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. I am Maribel Monterrubio. I, am, I live in Mexico, and I am the CEO of Vitalis, an asset management firm uh, that has been one of the 10 most important asset managers in, in my country. And I would like to, to, to share with you that I am part of the Empower program of the G20. And what we are trying to do is try to open opportunities for women, for women in, 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 the, in, in companies. So uh, I have like some notes that I would like to, to share. And, and, and I think that, that that will help us to put some context, so, context so from when, when we are right now. So, uh, okay, let me just one second, just, okay. Mm, sorry, 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 I have to hear you. So, well, we can come. We can come back if you like. Okay, to. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. All right. So, but if you could introduce yourself and then um, also share your first job. Okay. So my name is Betty Kumaho. I am the founder of an advisory firm that's primarily a tech advisory firm, but we also do design thinking <clears throat> and traditional management consulting. Um, we've done work primarily in Africa. Um, and this is my third business build. Uh, so I've built three other businesses, which were all in the advisory professional services space. Um, one of them, and, I, and then I was the managing director for a tech firm called ThoughtWorks. Uh, we expanded across Africa and actually got nominated as best company of the year in 2013. Um, there we achieved uh, women about 26%. Um, in my firm, we actually managed to get to women percentage of um, 50%, about 50%. Um, and that is never enough. So it's a pleasure to be here to contribute my lessons learned as well as learned from others. Um, and my first was. Okay, and I think you went out for a little bit, Betty. What was your first job? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My first job was bus driver. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Eva, you could go next, please. Yeah, thank you. So I'm Eva, I'm based in Berlin. I'm the director and partner in Germany for Christian Yelia de Gallery, focusing on contemporary art from all over the world. We currently represent a fantastic roster of young, young and uh, emerging artists from 23 different nations and are located in the UK, in Germany, in Norway, and soon in the US and Florida, in Palm Beach. Um, in, and I'm quite actively involved in the international NGO Oxfam. Uh, I'm there uh, as a member of the advisory board for the organization, focusing on the first aid, political campaigns, and long-term projects, um, as well as the head of supervisory board for the shops, which is a different legal entity. Um, I'm a founding member of Women in Arts and Media, WAM. We just founded that organization to support uh, women in the field and you know, do the networking. Uh, and I'm a very happy mom of three little ones. So mine are quite tiny, they're four, six and nine years old, which is kind of relevant being, you know, being to this topic as well, talking about gender and uh, yeah, works. And your first job was? Oh, yeah. My first job uh, was actually uh, working for Nivea, for the cream, you know, in oh, New Zealand okay. as, a, as, a, as a junior. Okay. In okay. New Zealand, actually. Okay. Thank you. So, Marco? I cannot compete with that. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is uh, Marco Behrendt. I'm 
um, partner with um, Ellen and Overy, which is an international law firm, so I'm a lawyer. Um, my field of specialization is employment law, and I'm um, also heading the um, global employment practice of Ellen and Overy. So um, as that, um, what I'm doing is basically two things. As a partner, I'm an employer. Um, so um, I am, am responsible for the teams for, for in Germany, in, in outside of Germany, all around, um, and have to, well, take care of male colleagues, female colleagues, um, look at what gender diversity looks like within the firm, um, um, what are the management decisions in that respect, and, and, and foster that. And second, I'm advising clients, uh, mostly international clients, um, large international clients, some are leading in their fields, um, and in particular in HR topics. So I'm advising them uh, in all employment law related issues and in particular, most recently, with regard to gender diversity, diversity in general, um, um, how can um, 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 ideas be implemented within the company um, with, with consultation with um, unions and works councils, etc., and how creative can one be? Uh, just one example during during um, the pandemic, um, um, how can uh, large companies with tens of thousands of employees manage their workforce um, all working from home, etc.? So that is my job. So I see um, internally as an employer, and in particular externally with my clients, um, many different ways how to deal with um, the topic gender diversity and, and supporting um, um, women also in the, on the executive level. Um, my first job was, um, well, lawyers are very boring because they start to become a lawyer after university and then they usually stay lawyer. Um, but my first job was um, a waiter. Um, and I did that during all of my time uh, when I went to school from 16 years on uh, up until my state examination, I was a waiter and I loved that. And when I uh, stop being a lawyer, I will become a waiter again. <laughs> All right. Maribel, did you uh, find what you were looking to share as part of your introduction? No, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's, it's, no, no. You know. Okay, well, what I wanted to say is that despite the numerous efforts from governments and the business world over the past decades to construct a more equal and inclusive society across countries, women's global labor force participation is only 38.8, far behind men participation rates. And there is a persistent lack of women in leadership positions. Women occupy only 27% in management positions and just over 26 of seats of, on board of publicly listed companies across OECD countries, and less than 8% of Fortune 500 companies, and only 1% of IPO listed organizations. So this is an, an issue that women face across Facebook streets, and that impacts even further women from emerging markets. No, that, that is, that we, we, there is a lack of, of, of of, of information, opportunities in, in, in emerging countries for women. And so I wanted to say those numbers to make uh, like a, a context, these are world numbers, but to know that emerging markets, are, are, we, we need to try hard. Thank you so much. Did you share your first job with us? Just oh, no, I didn't share you. Oh, <laughs> I, I work for an insurance broker company. Um, I used to be, I don't know the word in English, like the archives. I used to put the the papers of oh, files. <laughs> the files, exactly. <laughs> it was a file, uh, file women, uh, women, women there. Okay. And Christine, we are grateful that you have been able to join us. Um, hope that we can hear you when you speak, but we'd like it just a very brief and quick introduction as well as your first job, and then we'll get to the conversation. Yeah, thank you for your patience. Um, and I must, I must applaud for Frank Jurgen, of course. Um, because it, it was something to do with my email. And since he was hanging in our session, he, he himself, the big Frank, was uh, changing it. So um, it was a technical default. Anyways, my first job, um, Christine, my first job was in international marketing and communications uh, with a worldwide product from Tasmania, which I found terrifically exciting coming from the Netherlands. 
uh, to Canada, to to um, Northern Europe, to the lowlands here in the Netherlands. Um, one minute I have, I heard in your email. So um, best I think I can say is that I'm all about strategic talents and they're with all about gender diversity, if I can say so. Okay. That's the shortest I can make it. That's perfect. That's perfect. So Maribel actually shared some statistics with us and a recent PECON report said that women managed companies are more likely to achieve their labor satisfaction goals than their male counterparts. And that results in a more profitable business, healthier communities and an improved quality of customer experiences as well as other outcomes. But we still aren't seeing enough women um, in the C-suite. So you all have shared that you are truly a global panel and have experiences in countries as um, with first jobs in, in other places, other hemispheres even. So can you share with us some of the, the, the differences and some of the barriers in your respective countries and countries in which you do work to changing um, business leadership to be more reflective of our communities as a whole with more women? And we could start, uh, let's start with Betty this time, if you don't. Sure. I see you um, moving, so I see you on my <laughs> I, I, just, I just participated in a study for West Africa, so the ECOWAS region, where we were asking this very question is, how do we start to change the pipeline? Um, how do we grow the pipeline? How do we expand the pipeline? Do we need to accelerate the pipeline? And um, my input was really that, that we certainly have a culture on the African continent that women are the backbone of the continent. We know them to be powerful. We understand them to be powerful and we understand them to be very capable. Um, but what I think we don't do necessarily is we don't provide them all the support that they need. So fairly early on, they become mothers, they become wives, um, and they become caretakers for their parents. And so I think what we're not doing as well is kind of plotting out 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and figuring out what kind of support is needed um, through all of those decades of life. And so I think what will be important is to figure out employment structures, work structures that support women. Um, a friend of mine once told a story about she was starting a flower farm and she was determined to make sure that she was supporting women, um, diversity of, of workforce. And so she hired all women to run the farm and paid them what she thought was a fairly decent wage. Um, well, she started seeing that a lot of women were resigning. And she wasn't able to get women in that particular region or that particular village to join the farm. And what she found out was that the women were having a problem because they were earning more than their husbands and, and more than anybody else in their family. And so rather than deal with that, they were actually resigning from the job and giving up the money entirely because it just couldn't compete with what they would have to compete with at home. So, and we have to be aware of the context in which women are having to work and find a way to level that field so that they can participate in the workforce and still manage all of their caretaking responsibilities um, at home in the cultures in which they live. I find that so interesting. What you're saying. Um, sorry, Christine. Um, because no, no, go ahead. Um, one of the questions Thank you. One of the questions in a preparation list was, uh, how do we see uh, the differences? But uh, given what was just shared with us, I would like to um, invite us all to look at the universal communities. You know, what do we have in common? Because it is a universal issue. And support is what you brought up. And support, I think support is always needing to go with something like support from whom? Is it inter or intra supportive? Do we as women really support each other? Do we need support of the 
other gender or do we need to need to support the other gender? So support in itself is a big issue or topic, you know, issue sounds so low then. It's not what I mean. I, I mean to keep it light. What you just say, you know, from Ghana to, to the Netherlands, to Norway, it's universal. So just, yeah. and I, and I think it is in a direction. And I think it is contextual as well, right? Because it always the, the degree to, yeah, so I think it's complex. It's a big topic and it's a complex topic. I agree with you. It's the most complex uh, diversity topic, by the way. That is proven. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research about that. And, you know, we don't need to dismiss ourselves, but we're all biased against women. Men and women are biased against women. That has been researched for many, many years now. I find it really interesting as, as the only men in this, um, mm -hmm. on this panel. Um, it's it's always difficult for me to take your perspective, obviously. But I think it's for me personally right now. It's really interesting that you use the word support. Um, all conversations I had in Germany, um, and in Germany, the word is unterstützen. Yeah. Um, all women say, "I don't need support." I, yeah. th that is not what what um, what equal treatment of women means that men or women support women. We just need the same opportunities men have. And, and they are sometimes different. Because, I just said it, um, women um, become mothers and, and that, that is, is by nature different um, from fathers. Um, and so the, so the, the doors which are opened, which need to be opened, might be different. But support, I don't know. Um, it, it surprises me that you so openly say women need support. So Eva, if you could jump yeah, in. Yeah, I think I, I really love the story with the women, you know, like perception about the, you know, like getting too much money. Yeah, Michael. And uh, Michael. Sorry, oh, Eva. Yeah. Okay, Eva was. There was like there was this uh, echo. Right. Uh, that, that, that's why I stopped. No, yeah, go anyway, ahead. I think it's definitely. We need a holistic oh, um, solution, in, including, um, you know, not only supporting women or giving women the same chance, but also getting our men to also feel that, you know, like that they are part, equally part of everything. And I especially refer to becoming a family because this is still a very relevant topic why women do not, you know, go their career path in such a quick way than, you know, like compared to men. And uh, I really think I would love, you know, like, I would really love, there's like so much um, happening in Christine, Germany. Are we on? Oh, yeah. Are you good? So much. I so, so much. So just for a technical, because we're having some reverb, what I'm going to do, Christine, if you could mute and Eva, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If she could, Eva could finish her answer. And then when you get ready to speak, unmute because we're getting some feedback from your your line that cleared up when I muted you. And I can mute you if you. OK. All right. Go ahead, Eva. I'm so sorry. No, fine. But um, so what I really thought, I mean, you know, in Germany, a lot of things happening. We have a maternity leave and we have parental leave and we have support. Da, 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 da. But. It's always focusing on, you know, like you are a young woman starting in a company and you get all the information about, you know, maternity leave. Da, da, da. But men don't get that, you know, that they don't get that information because it's part of the woman to take care of that. But just imagine all young men would understand, OK, once you may become a family, you know, you can take paternity leave because they can parental leave. I'm sorry. They can do that, but it's still something, you know, like it's always, you know, like only the women do that. But it is something, you know, we are, you know, we should take care equally for our kids. And we should both think about, you know, part time work. We should think about really going to Kita, going to school. And I have a lot of friends now in Berlin. We are like kind of doing that, but it's a bubble. It's still not normal. And I think this is really important on this, you know, like the perspective. Per per perception of equally men and women thinking about solutions 
for becoming a family, like just putting in this, you know, specific role, be, becoming a family, because that's quite relevant for the career. The other part is definitely, which also helps to have some, you know, quota to uh, support women. And then now we talk about support because that was a big discussion in Germany. Do we need a quota, a percentage of 30% in advisory board for companies like big companies, stock market companies. So this is something else. And there, yes, it is support for the time being to understand that, yes, women can do the job equally, you know, and as well as, as boys. So Maribel, what do you see? Or, or are there yeah. any things in particular in Mexico? Yeah, with this conversation? yeah. what I was say, what I, well, of course, uh, like in Mexico, it's, it's, we need to prove in a lot of things. We, it, there is a gap, you know, uh, we are well known as we have like a macho culture here. So women have to try harder, not just for a job, if for, for to prove that we can do it. But we have been doing a lot of efforts to improve this, and it's in, but it's still, we are in an early stage. But what I wanted to say a little bit to, to support what Eva just said is that that was one of the lasting positive things that we learned from the pandemic, that we need to understand that there are different necessities and, and conditions for, for, for the people. We don't need to treat everyone the same way. To put simply, we learned that maybe the hard way that our co-workers have a life outside the office and that they have parents, kids, partners, even pets and to attend and to take care for. So starting from this understanding as business leaders, I believe that we should constantly practice self-examination, pondering the way our leadership impacts to people in our team, not even if they are women or men. And I have to gain like two insights from this. The first is that we need to be flexible and to understand that and to lead people that they have different needs. And the second is that that uniqueness is indeed the definitive feature of human beings. So, so I think that since the industrial revolution, the assumption that we must adapt to a giant mechanism of the factory in some ways was unable to adapt to this gigantic machine the problem was the person, not the mechanism. No? And right now, I think that we need to have a, a view for the person. The, you know, the problem is not the person. The problem sometimes is the mechanism, or most of the time is the mecha mechanism. So uh, what I really believe is that we have a challenge there, and we need to be supportive for, for, for our co-workers, even though they are women or men. And, in, 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 and if we educate them and support them, and we believe that everyone is unique, then we could understand what are the needs of each of them and support them to, to get where they need to get, even though if it's a management posi position or it's a CEO position, or but you need to treat them like everyone is unique. It's not that you need to, to be the same for everybody. So quit you fair, quit fair. I, I'm not meaning that to be unfair, but what I need you need to understand that there are different necessities for people. We are not all alike. So you talked about appreciating uniqueness and, and flexibility. So I'd also like to hear from all of you all about different solutions, right, that maybe achieve that flexibility or how um, any examples or success stories that. Um, appreciate that uniqueness in a way that helps us on this journey. So uh, Christine, since you're off mute, go ahead and, and if you could share, please. Took me so long to come in, you know, so now I want to speak out loud. Hey, Marco, <laughs> Marco, one thing, um, one thing I find truly dear to my heart, you say support is new to me. I understand that. But, and, and just mixing all what we have said here, you know, um, I think it's not about equality so much uh, and how we fashioned and worn out that term. It's about equality, meaning we're different yet equal. Eh? Equal yet different. And if you find in your firm, which I can fully understand, you know, in, in executive search, the firms are like the law firms. Mm -hmm. we, we, we as women don't seek support from people that are not in our basket. This is just what it is, because how can you support us if you don't know where we really are? It's like, you know, I'm also a mother to three. 
you know, I'm not a father to free. I'm a mother to free. And Corona has demonstrated us that we are the glue of society. That's the feminine principle. And in Africa, you know, it's already for ages. You know, you never lost it. We lost it. You didn't. Solutions. <coughs> Solutions, really strong solution directions for me mm -hmm. is this is also what we do in, in, in our global platform. We look for diversity in thinking, meaning opening boards, board directorships for different archetypes, if you wish. And I have, you know, we also do soul language where we look at archetypes and the deeper layers of your, your, your soul structure. So, and that is jumping all for gender. Now, and then, so, you know, if we place, Christine, and you, um, in, in your environment, you know it so well. You now, if we have more board directors, female board directors, they are of influence of the chiefs, you know? So I say it's C before B, you know? Because I believe when you have the experience as a chief executive whatsoever and then roll into a B board and board director position, then you can play your influence. Then we open a port and then it becomes a pull. It's not a push anymore. And I have difficulties with the push. Um, I think the pull would be way more healthy. So that is one thing. The organizational models and models, I talk to you because we, <laughs> professional services is like, you know, the worst of the worst, right? We are inside, inward looking and nothing changes, you know, and, and being an entrepreneur is the most beautiful position in this world we can have for change. But we have the corporate business arena that needs to leverage us, different organizational models. I give you one simple example, Christine. You gave some breakdown, you know, in in your introduction, or Frank maybe did. Uh, there's two third men, one third women. I tell you, it's not going to change this this generation. It's not going to change the next generation. Why? Why? You know why? Because we 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 don't allow it. And why don't we uh, allow it? Because we still hang in. In the um, we, we we must and we can. So there is this push where I believe what would be beautiful is that that we speak out loud. You know, Markov, all the young lawyers, the ladies don't want this. They are not attractive to any new husbands. You know, they don't want to be a partner like this. They want maybe to be a one point a FTE in a workplace to be a full partner. So that is changes within, within organizational models. So, so you talked about creating a pool via boards and I think Betty wants to jump in and, and share you. some things and solutions that she's seen. I, I will share. I completely agree with you, Christine. I don't know why we haven't met before, but, <laughs> but this is, this is absolutely my experience. I started my introduction by saying I ran a firm, managed to get to 26%. I started my own firm, managed to get to 50%. And I knew it was never going to go any further. Even me as a woman leader, it was not going to change until we get women on boards. And so I agree that we can talk about a lot of different solutions, but that is the key tipping point. Until we make that happen, we're not going to change the tide. Um, and it, I'll tell another story that I was... And on a panel of, uh, I was judging, there you were know, seven judges, and it was a tech uh, competition. It was a Google tech competition. And there was one group that came in, so it was probably about nine groups, one group that came in that was women-led, and they had a very interesting solution around managing your pantry and your fridge with by scanning barcodes and actually sending orders. And I was surprised that just compared to all of the other solutions, even technically, they just didn't place anywhere. And so we were in the judging room and I looked around and I realized that out of the seven judges, I was the only woman. So until I spoke up, no one really rethought really about it because, and, and I just asked the men a simple question. 
how many of you have to make the grocery list and go buy it? None of them did. All of the wives did. So until I was in that room, no one saw the value of what that team was producing. And that's just the reality. No one will see what women need to be supported through the different levels of their careers until we have women in the boardroom. So have you seen, so we've talked about boardrooms. So have you all seen any other, so Maribel in, in financial services, Eva in um, media and in the arts, have you all seen anything that has been a different approach to including more women? Yes. Um, it's all, it, it, I'm just going to put it and then I shut down again. It, it, it's across all industries, I'm sure. We have statistics. Yeah, no, 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 but I was asking them about their industries, respectively, about what they've seen. Okay, thank you. So, Mirabel, if you could go ahead. And yes, share. yes, yes. Of course, there's been a, a, a huge effort to, to include women in management executive positions and boards. In Mexico, there are some organizations that are trying to push that that initiative, and I myself, I'm part of, of, of a couple of boards, so I'm happy, but still, there's one woman in, in the board, there's no more than that. <laughs> we are doing a good a good effort to, of course, there's a gap, but I think we are on the right, on the right side. And it's like a good a moment to, to for women to, to, to get there, to be, be ready to get there and to think that they are old enough to be in any seat, you know. Sometimes what I've seen in in, in, in Latin women is that we need to have like we, we try to be perfect in order to apply to a, a board. Sometimes you know, do need to be perfect. You just need to to know a little bit this from some area and that you could serve the world. So I think it's, it's education in both sides, not just men, also women, to be part of, of the same for, for the same world in, in, in different ways. So yes, I, I, I have seen a, a good effort in, in, in Mexico. Regarding the financial sector, it's it's very it's, it's very interesting to notice that, for example, in Latin America, the positions in financial sector has been growing, but more in, in ESG positions, like, like ESG positions or finance, or in those ESG matters, you see a lot of women. So I'm happy because well, that is what is going to change everything, no? When you have ESG factors, then you put to be better, and you see a lot of women in, in those areas. Like in typical traditional finance, well, right now in, in Latin America, you can see a, little, a lot of, of, of men there. But, but every time you see a little more women participate. So Eva, you've worked in a couple of different sectors. You're currently in the arts now, but so can you share, have you seen any innovative solutions as uh, now in media and arts, you would think that they may have some solutions that other sectors haven't thought of or, or some creative approaches to gender diversity? Just one comment. Can we all unmute uh, when we don't speak? Because I still have this like really strong feedback. So um, yeah, so what I quickly wanted to share with you with regards to Oxfam, for example, which is not arts and media, but it's still interesting because, for example, in Oxfam, like our advisory board, like the one is actually only female. It was not intended, but um, but uh, at uh, Oxfam, you know, like the, the, the organization with 160 people, this is like now one step also. There's like strong women leaders, but it's also, um, you know, implementing more feminist principles with regards to communication structures, uh, democratic decisions. And I think that's like also supporting, you know, like I remember when I was, I was originally from the business world and I worked in big companies. And when I got my first like leading position, my boss told me, Eva, you're doing everything really well, but you are not good in you know using your elbows you need to be better and i really thought i don't want to be better in using my elbows i want to do it my way but this has i think started to change and for example oxfam is an organization really focusing not only on supporting you know like women in leading positions but also in uh, implementing you know structures 
which is more related to you know feminist feminist uh, you know like uh, behaviors and I think that also helps and you know that you know we are getting used to it just one tiny story as well because I read an article today in the newspaper about a women woman comedian comedian she's quite famous and she said when you know like it was just some years ago moderators at the radio for example when you listened to radio songs they were advised not to play two female songs like songs uh, singing by female voices uh, uh, after each other because that might disturb men because you know two times women in a row is not good and some radio stations still follow that rule but that also is a perspective where you can see you know we need to change that you know like it's people think that is normal because sometimes a woman is okay but actually we are part of that and we are good at it and i think that is a is a process where we can really also help with quota and with you know thinking about principles changing to feminist feminist uh, support and so markov you work with lots of different companies so if you could kind of wrap this up with anything innovative that you've seen across um, either your firm or the companies that you work with well innovative is a, is a good 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 um, good question uh, what is innovative um, um, some are more innovative than, than others. I basically see um, one trend, which is a bit older, and which is um, that many companies set their selves internal quota, that they say we want, despite of any uh, the lack of any laws, we want more women um, in our leaderships. Um, that are those, well, in its majority, big companies, most of them come from the U.S., um, um, who are a bit, uh, I told you that before, um, 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 in, in the US, I think the trends start and then it takes a while until, until they come to the UK and then after a couple of years, they finally end up in Germany. We are a bit slow. Um, so that is one thing. And most recently, I think um, many companies have kind of found the 100% flexibility as the magic tool for everything because you already mentioned that and i think it's right there is no one solution for everything um so uh, the, every woman is an individual every man is an individual and you cannot find the magic trick which m matches everything but 100 percent flexibility makes it easier because then you say we had rules and those rules were like for example you have to be in the office from nine to four or five or six, and we measure your performance, for example, by presence time. Automatically, that's a problem for women who have to take care for their children, um, who, who are, well, cannot, cannot work that rigidly. Um, and uh, by softening those rules, in particular due to Corona, um, and suddenly many more things become possible. And um, clients see that and uh, foster that and say, okay, let's not go back to old normal. Let's see the opportunities this has brought to us and let's um, offer all of our employees. And by the way, this has of course also an impact for men um, um, who suddenly um, realize, oh wow, I can be there for my children without um, um, well being kicked out at my job or stuff. So suddenly fantastic. So everything becomes different because of that flexibility and many employers um, are strongly making use of that. Okay. All right. So unfortunately, we only have one brief moment left. Um, <laughs> and so I want to thank you all for joining us and very quickly, um, I don't think we'll get shut off, but if you could just very quickly in one sentence share one thing that you wish that both women and men coming in uh, to the workforce would have that would help our workplaces be more diverse. So just one sentence from all of you. And we're going to start with Eva, if you don't mind, and then we'll go. Okay. Oh, we can't. I can, sorry, I can just support what Mark said. I completely agree with that. 100% flexibility in work times uh, is helping men and women to really do not only their job, but also take care of their family lives. So that's definitely something which will help us. Okay. Mervel. 
Well, as I said before, I think like flexibility and understand uniqueness in a fairly atmosphere and support both men and, and women to grow and to become better employees, better person. Okay. Betty? Uh, the world is changing. Um, we need a lot more balance in our lives between who we are at work and what we have to do at home. Um, and so, yeah, it's all about balance and equity. It's not about only women or only men. Um, it's about having mixes of all of those combinations. So we have to get good at becoming a balancing act as human, social human beings. Yeah. Okay. And Christine? I would love to see in the upcoming time, post-COVID, that we are really able to, to swap time to trust. So trust versus time. And Markov, and then you'll close us out. Um, I think flexibility is in, indeed a magical tool, but I think the key lies in the change of culture. Um, we really need to change cultural things. We need to do continuous trainings of bias. We have to uh, foster awareness that diversity is something to embrace, that that is something positive, and, and that equality is nothing you have to really well, work on, but it's, it's, it's a positive and good thing. And that is a cultural change. It will come over time. And that's what I really do hope. Mm. And that is the perfect way uh, to end our panel today. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom, um, your stories, and your smiles. And Frank, and uh, run the world. Thank you and have a, a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christine. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you, Christine. Bye -bye. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine.